Well, uh, we're talking about soul, what soul actually means. And we know that it means spirit-led, obedient, unified, loving people. And that's what we want to be. That's what we want to develop. That's what um, we want everybody who comes inside these walls to know that's what we represent. It's people who want to become, who want to grow and become spirit-led, obedient, unified, loving Christians or loving people. The guy who wrote, oh, I'm sorry, today we're going to start talking about obedience. I forgot to say that. The guy who wrote, uh, John Newton, the, the, the writer of uh, Amazing Grace, this is one of the things that he said. If two angels in heaven were given an assignment by God at the same time, one of them had to go and rule over the greatest nation on earth, and the other one was going to sweep the streets of the dirtiest village on earth. Each angel would be completely indifferent to which one got the assignment. Uh, it simply wouldn't matter to them. Why? Because the real joy lies in being obedient to God. For a Christ follower, the most important thing isn't what God assigns us to do. But the most important thing is uh, we're doing what God wants us to do. So the assignment doesn't matter. But the only thing that matters is what God, is we're doing what God wants us to do. And that's the definition that we're going to use for obedience. Doing what God wants us to do. And um, a lot of you know the story that that wasn't my story. It wasn't my case. I, this is not something I wanted to do. I never wanted to be a pastor. never wanted to be... Um, preaching to people on Sunday mornings at the church. I just didn't want to do it. Uh, but one thing I can say is that when you're obedient to God, He takes care of you in a special way. And I am satisfied more now than I've ever been doing anything I've ever done. And I've had a chance to do a lot of stuff. So let's look at Matthew uh, chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. And this is actually uh, the baptism of Jesus. We've talked about it before. But I want to turn the camera. A little bit this time. Talk about it before uh, in the light of Jesus and how he had to deal uh, with being tempted by Satan. But this time we want to look at it from John's perspective. John is the one who actually had to baptize Jesus, um, given that challenge. So Matthew chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. It says, But John tried to prevent him, Jesus. He said, I need to be baptized by you. Why are you coming to me? But Jesus answered him, saying, Well, permit it for this time, because it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John permitted, uh, permitted him. <coughs> After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, this is my beloved son, of whom I am well pleased. The important thing for us as believers, again, is not what God has us doing. But the only thing that really matters is that we're doing what God wants us to do. I think about John in this scripture, in this passage of scripture. Here it is. He's baptizing people. Think about this now. He's standing on the hill preaching and talking and Saying, all right, you got to repent. You got to be baptized. You got to know who Jesus is. And over the hill walks Jesus. Walks down to John and said, okay, baptize me then, John. And John said, what are you, uh, what? You know? So the very first thing that jumps out about obedience, look at this from John's perspective. When it comes to us being obedient, when it comes to us doing what God wants us to do, if we think about it, obedience uh, sometimes we don't understand why we need to be obedient. That was John's case. So here comes Jesus over the hill and he says, baptize me. And John said, man, I, you need to be baptizing me. Now think about this now. He's begging and pleading and proclaiming the gospel, telling people to repent, be born again, then be baptized. And here's the Savior. He don't want to baptize him. Uh, I don't understand. Why do I need to baptize you? 
You're the Savior. You're the Christ. You're the chosen one. Why do I need to baptize you? And then Jesus says, because we have to do it this way for the scriptures to be fulfilled. And then John admitted, but think about it. It didn't make sense to John. That's why I can't question it. The, the, the scripture actually uh, um, suggests that John was almost trying to tell Jesus, no, I don't care what you say, what you do, I'm not baptizing you. He was, no, I'm not going to do it. You know, he was trying to stop Jesus from being baptized, all because he did not understand what God was trying to do. I thought about that in my life. How many times have I uh, been hard-headed? How many times have I fought back, pushed back against God when you know, because when, listen, when God speaks, you know that, don't you? We understand when it, the voice of God is completely clear because it usually doesn't make sense. It doesn't sound like anything that I'm used to hearing. So when God speaks, it doesn't make sense. And I begin to question, well, what's really going on? What's happening? I don't know what's going on. But it didn't make sense. So obedience, most of the time, when it really comes from God, it's not going to make sense to our natural ears. Just like it did to John. But what he was saying was, um, how can I put this? Jesus, if there was ever anyone who didn't need to be baptized, it's you. So why am I baptizing you? The whole point is, God wants us to see the big picture. A lot of times, the role that we play in the big picture, we don't understand how it fits. John didn't understand how it fitted for him to baptize the Messiah. He couldn't see it. But then when Jesus in the said, it has to be this way because we want to have Scripture fulfilled. He said, okay, oh, I understand. But a lot of times, God may not give you understanding, but we have to do it anyway. Even when you don't understand, you got to be obedient. Even when it doesn't make sense, you have to be obedient. Not because God needs you to be obedient. Or God demands for you to be obedient, but you never know how significant your one act of obedience can be to the kingdom of God. Think if John wouldn't have baptized Jesus. You ever think about that? One act of obedience can change the course of the world. Your one act. Even if you don't understand, your one act of obedience can change or reshape the entire destination, the entire destiny of people if you choose to be obedient to God's voice. So even if you don't understand, that's okay. You don't have to. Why? Because in Isaiah chapter 55, God says, listen, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts. So it's not important for you to understand. It's important for you to be obedient. Because if we wait to understand that kind of distance, we'll never be able to understand it, right? But your one act of obedience can change the life of thousands, millions, and on and on and on. Then the second thing is that um, obedience... It gives us a chance to see through our spiritual eye. Look at this. It says, he, after he permitted, uh, after John said it's okay to baptize Jesus, he baptized Jesus, and immediately um, when he came about the water, he, if you look at the word he, that's the little h, which means it wasn't Jesus, but it was John. I never paid attention to that until I was reading it this time. I always thought about he, meaning Jesus, saw the Spirit because that's who was being baptized. No, it's a little h. Y'all see that in the scripture? It's a little h, which means it's not Jesus saying, it's John saying. It says, he saw the Spirit of God descending on Jesus like a dove and lighting on him. How many things have I missed because my spiritual eyes were closed? How many things has God wanted to show me, but I couldn't perceive because of my disobedience and my spiritual eyes were closed? How much more would I be in awe if God showed me through my obedience every time something amazing and supernatural? And I look back in my life and think about all the times I've been hard here. All the times God wanted me to go his way, and I chose to go that way. How much did I miss seeing spiritually because I was disobedient? If John hadn't baptized Jesus, he never would have really had his spiritual eyes open to what God can do. 
when we are disobedient in our life, we never really get the real concept. All that God has done for us in our life, when we choose to be disobedient, we are really missing out on what God really wants to show us. Because he wants to show himself strong and mighty. And we understand that he is by just the little things that we've already seen through our little bit of them. But what if we really totally sold out and said, God, whatever you want me to do, however you want me to do it, I'm going to do it. How much more will God show us spiritual things to make you go, oh my goodness, I can't handle it. So that's what happened to John. It said when he was obedient and he baptized Jesus, he came by the water and John was, can you imagine that? Nothing like this had ever been seen by anybody before. It ain't been seen like the body, body since from what I read in the Bible. The spirit descending like a dove. In other words, it was so sweet and so peaceful and so serene, you couldn't help but to call it a dove. You ever seen a morning dove? They out there, you're eating. It just looks so beautiful, so pretty. So John said, that is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. Because his spiritual eyes had been opened. <coughs> If he did not obey, he would have missed out on something that's never been seen before or since. When we choose to be disobedient, that might be the only opportunity that God ever has to really show us something so significant that it could change the rest of our lives. So John, even though he didn't understand, he was obedient. And because he was obedient, he had a chance to have his spiritual eyesight open. And then the last part of the scripture says um, uh, that the voice of God busted through the, through the clouds and it said, this is my son of whom I'm well pleased. Can you imagine the voice of God? Nobody had ever heard that before in this day. God didn't speak like that. This is my son of whom I'm well pleased. So our obedience pleases God, because Jesus obeyed. See, because the truth of the matter is, just like John discovered, Jesus didn't have to be baptized. He knew why God said it. He knew what he came to do. So it wasn't mandatory for him to be baptized. Why? Because he had never sinned. He never had to repent of anything in turn. He was the one that was paying for our sins. But what Jesus was doing, he was being an example for what we should do. And because of that, God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. An example is something that needs to be followed. So if Jesus did it, let a man baptize him, then what does that say about us? We need to do it too, but the biggest thing I want you to see is that he was an example. That's the reason why God was really pleased, because he set the example of following what God said to do. Because if it's God's son, the chosen one, the savior of the world, if he was obedient, First of all, to be baptized by man when he didn't need to be baptized. And to follow what God said do. And then take it all the way to the cross and die on the cross as our example of how to sacrifice and give ourselves for others. What does that say that we need to do? We need to follow Christ's example so people in 2013 can have an example of what they should follow. Because they don't have the benefit like John. They didn't see Jesus coming over the hillside. The only Jesus they see is you walking into your job every day, or into the school building, or into the playground, wherever we go. The only example they have now is us. So we follow Jesus' example in the baptism. We follow his example into loving other people, into doing what God called us to do, into sacrificing ourselves. And it's, even if it causes me having to die to me to, to see that you see Jesus, that's what we do. So you become the example of Jesus that people see. So God said, I'm well pleased with my example who I've sent in Jesus. Well, he died and saved us and he's going back to heaven. Now we become a multitude of examples of what Jesus is to people. So we obey the voice of the Lord because Jesus was our example. Now it's our turn to be the example. So when God says go and do, we don't have to question it because he knew he takes care of us. We go and we do. Because obedience is all about doing what God wants us to do. And I think about John. Look at all of this. He baptized Jesus, gets up, here comes the dove, here comes the voice. And John is watching. Think about how much that deepened John's resolve. Nothing like this had ever been seen or done before. 
a, a Savior had never been on the face of the earth. And now the voice of God is descending like a, I mean, hollering and, and telling and the Spirit is descending. Think about how much that deepened what he already believed. So when we do what God asks us to do, when we are obedient to the voice of God, every time it gives us a little deeper resolve to stay committed to the cause. Because God always reveals himself, obviously, because John was obedient, he saw what God can do. So it gave him John's resolve so much that and he ended up being beheaded. Y'all do know that, right? They chopped his head off because he wouldn't quit preaching. But he had seen what happened in the river and in the pond, wherever they were at. When he baptized Jesus, he, he saw the, the, the Spirit. He heard God's audible voice. And he said, I don't care what happens to me in my life because I obeyed the voice of God. I saw what he's doing for Jesus. I'm going to keep on doing what I'm supposed to do. So when he faced opposition, when he faced persecution, when he faced hard times, he still listened and followed the voice of God. It cost him his life. Okay. It cost him everything he had, but that didn't deter him from doing what God called him to do. Now, what does that say to me? Me, when if you scream me the wrong way, I sometimes I cower down. But God didn't want us to do that. If we know we heard from God. Come trouble or uh, victory or whatever, our job is to follow through with what God has called us to do. So that's John. Looking at it through John's eyes, he didn't understand. But because he didn't understand it anyway, he got to be a part of something that's never been done before. And he got to witness the onset of the real ministry of Jesus Christ. What does that mean for you and me? How can we take this and incorporate it in our life Monday morning? Well, the first thing that we have to understand is that obedience is a choice. You believe that? Talk a little bit about that last week about you know being spirit-led is also a choice. Well, if you're spirit-led and then you become obedient, that's also a choice. Looking at the Old Testament, one of my favorite stories from the Old Testament, we don't talk about it a lot because it's kind of gruesome. But Saul went and told Samuel one time, he said, hey, Saul, I heard from God last night. And you know Amalek, they've been persecuting and tearing the church. God wants him dead. So you take your army, you go to Saul and his people, you kill every one of them. Kill all the people, the men, women, boys, and children. Don't leave nobody alive. All the goats, sheep, cows, oxen, kill everything. And don't leave nothing standing. We want them to know that God did this. So Saul goes over to Amalek. First of all, he liked Amalek. You're a good dude. I ain't going to kill you. Keep you with me. All oh, those fine cows. I'm going to keep those and keep them with me. And Saul came back and said, why have you done what I told you not to do? God said, go kill everybody. Here it is that you letting uh, stuff live. Saul said, well, Lord, I want to keep some of that stuff because I want to make a sacrifice. We can't sacrifice nothing that God already said kill. That's a side note, footnote. That's another sermon. But the point is, Saul made a choice. To not do what God said do. And it cost him the kingdom. Samuel, I mean, uh, yeah, Samuel came back and told Saul, Saul, today you lost the kingdom because you disobeyed. In other words, it's a choice. He had the choice to do what God said and get rid of Amalek because Amalek was probably going to come back and kill some more uh, uh, um, Israelites because he didn't like him anyway. But Saul let him live. But Saul said, well, I'm going to go ahead and kill him anyway. So he ended up killing the king and trying to do it. But do it right the first time. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. Yeah. 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 So, here it is. They cost him some. So my, my, my point is this. Whenever you choose, you, whenever you choose, God is a perfect gentleman. He's not going to guard his way in. He's going to give you the, the option to choose. Whenever you choose to do what God say or not do what God say, there are consequences attached to your decision. Whenever you choose as a child not to obey mom and dad, there are consequences attached. Don't do this. They don't sit and ask them why. Because mom and dad said so. Because they've been down that road before. They understand you make this mistake, it may cost you this. Same thing with Saul. He didn't, uh, same thing with uh, yeah, Saul. He didn't do it, so it cost him the kingdom. But that was his choice. So you have a choice to make. We can be obedient to God's voice. Or we can be disobedient. Either way, we're going to suffer the consequences. Either way. So if I know what kind of man God is and I choose not to follow what he says do and I run into hard times, that's just how it is. That was my choice. It's not God's fault. That's my 
follow. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so it's a choice. Then the second thing is, it may be uncomfortable. Following God's voice may be uncomfortable. Think about Paul, the, the carrier of the word to the Gentiles. Paul was a persecutor of the church. Anybody that named the name of Christ, they called Paul, got his cell phone out. Hey, Paul, this is the Pharisees. Over in Corinth, we got a people, group of people calling themselves a church. Over in Ephesus, there's a good bunch of people calling themselves a church. And what you need to do is get you and five of your biggest henchmen and go kill them. That's what Paul did. He killed people who said they loved Jesus. And now he got saved on the road to Damascus. Now he's got to go preach to the same people who he used to kill. So imagine Paul busting up here killing everybody on this side of the room. We get away. Two months later, here in walks Paul talking about he's going to preach the good news of Jesus. What are we going to do? Slap him. There you go. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go to him. Mm -hmm. You kill my, you kill Pete. That's my, my partner. And I'm going to be like, it's, it's uncomfortable. So he's got to go right back to a place where he used to persecute people. That's uncomfortable. Have you ever uh, worked somewhere, had a, well, maybe not you, but I have, had a fight with somebody at, at that job and then left with them, but had to go back and then you see him at the store, uh, at the school. And then, how uncomfortable is that? When you know you've done wrong with somebody, but you got to see them again, and now God has changed your heart. And they never even know you got to say, that's uncomfortable. But that's where Paul was. So a lot of times when God asks us to be obedient, it may be uncomfortable, but that doesn't mean we don't need to obey. Because God gave Paul a mission, a commission, to go and preach the word to the Gentiles, regardless if they want to hear you or not. Because eventually, you know what happened with Paul. He was the biggest author in the New Testament. He was responsible for a lot of the churches and all the Asian countries over there at that time. Why? Because he was obedient to the voice of God, regardless of whether it was comfortable or not. Chances are, if you're comfortable doing what God said do, then that ain't God telling you to do anything. Chances are. Because he always wants you to move outside of your comfort zone. He always going to ask you to do something that's going to make you say, wait a minute, are you sure that's what you want me to do? Do you want the right track? If you ever say, wait a minute, God, are you sure? Ah, oh, then we're talking about God. But if it's something that's easy that you can do in your own strength, doesn't take you any effort to come for, that ain't God. Because God don't work like that. Read the scriptures. You'll see he don't work like that. It's He's always going to push you beyond what you think you're capable of. Paul said, I'm a killer, not a preacher. But you got to go preach, Paul. So Paul did it. And then, so that, that brings us back to John. It was uncomfortable for John to baptize Jesus because he realized that Jesus was the Savior. How am I going to come uh, baptize the Savior? Me, pitiful me. My life is riddled with mistakes that I've made. My life is filled with bad decisions. My life is filled with failures. How are you going to ask me, Jesus, to baptize you? Let, let me get in the water and you lay your hands on me and baptize me. Jesus said, no. I, Jesus, I, don't really, I, really, I, really, I really don't feel comfortable baptizing you. I mean, what am I going to say? In the name of the Father, the Son, in the name of the Father, you and the Holy Spirit. What am I going to say? <laughs> it was uncomfortable. But because he did it, he was rewarded. So what's my point? My point is this. Obedience is a choice. It may be uncomfortable, but obedience is always rewarded. It's your choice to make. You may have to move out of your comfort zone, but when you do it, <coughs> God always rewards your obedience. Talked about a long time ago when we were still over at uh, the community center, how I'll never preach a sermon about God wants to bless you. God wants to press it down, shake it together, and let it run over in your life, because I just don't believe that's how it works, because God rewards our obedience. The Bible says in the Old Testament that if you will be obedient to God, his blessings will overtake you. So it's not a matter of chasing the blessings. It's a matter of chasing God and being obedient to his call. 
That's, how, that's the real way you're blessed. Matter of fact, the real blessing of obedience is the fact that you're able to be obedient. Just being able, okay, I'm going to give it to you like this. Think about the dude that Jesus walked up to that was running around with the legion in it. Legion, by the way, means 6,000. He had 6,000 demons living in him. There was no way he could obey the voice of God on his own. So the very fact that you can obey God is a blessing because that means that you're changed and you can hear him. Yes. If you've never been changed, you can't hear God. So the very fact that you can't hear God enough to follow his uh, word, that you are blessed. Because some folks are crazy and out of their mind and have no concept of what the voice of God sounds like. Back to, the, back to the text. So, he always rewards us. Think about what he saw. Think about this. He got to share in the baptism of Christ. How many other people can say, ha, I baptized Jesus? Mm. Think about all the, all the, the, the dudes, the followers of Christ sitting around the table, you know, Peter, he bragging. Yeah, well, hey, I stood up on the day of Pentecost and because I preached, 7,000 uh, 7, people came to the Lord that day. And then John, well, hey, I was brother. You know, we knew something about each other. Look what I did. All I'm talking, nobody said, John finally said, but hey, without me, None of y'all could have done it because I baptized him. And you got something to, something to brag about. I brag about that. I baptized Jesus. A sinner baptizing a Savior. Ah! I got all y'all beat. But top that. Mm, he wouldn't sit down. And they got mad. They got quiet. He got to share in something that nobody else got to share in. He baptized the Savior of the world. He, he took something that very few people would have done and it became something that he will remember for the rest of his life. Even when times got hard, he faced opposition, faced the sword, faced being beheaded. He didn't change because he knew what he'd done on that hillside when he dipped down Jesus, saw the Spirit, heard the voice of God, changed him forever. And he was rewarded for his obedience. Baptizing the Savior. If nothing else, God, that's it. You've talked and you've done everything. When we are obedient, God will always do abundantly above all that we could ever ask to think, dream, or imagine because we are obedient to what his voice tells us to do. He rewards us. He rewards us. He's already given us eternal life and then he top it out by giving you stuff that you really don't need here on earth. He rewards us. Get up every day, his mercies are new. He blesses you, rain, sleep, and snow. He rewards us. Yeah, you sinned, you fell short, you didn't do what you're supposed to do today. That's okay. He doesn't count it against you. He threw it into the sea of forgiveness. He rewards us. He lets us eat of the good of the land because we are obedient to what he says. And that's a wonderful God. Amen. Because I don't deserve it. Amen. But it all boils down To doing what God wants you to do. So, here's the question I want you to answer. Am I doing what God wants me to do? I'll give you time to think. Because there is no better place than in the will of God. Have you ever experienced that? <coughs> there is nothing better than to know God says, I'm well pleased with Lance and Mary. I'm well pleased with Michael and Daria. Because we're doing what he wants us to do. So are you? And if not, why? What excuse do you have? Let's pray.